Tutorial. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for making me do this presentation. <laughs> uh, it turns out we've been presenting QMR Lab for a while, but never really as a full-fledged presentation. So I would always just kind of get, get slides from left and right, and never really thought about making this continuous 45-minute talk about it. And um, uh, I, I, you know, it's the first time I'm trying to give like a full-fledged tutorial. Uh, I think this is the perfect audience to uh, get feedback, so please let us know what made sense, what worked, what didn't work. Um, there's quite a lot of different uh, multimedia and interactive content in there, so let's hope that uh, technology doesn't fail us. Um, I will start with a presentation. Um, this is a video that um, uh, one of my students, uh, Jean-Francois Cabana, made uh, in 2017, I believe. And uh, Jean-Francois uh, is the reason QMR Lab exists. He uh, was about 35 when he finished his undergraduate degree. He had a background in production, in um, video editing. And uh, he uh, wanted to do a summer internship in my lab. And I was just starting and I said, I have this piece of code and software, but you know, I really don't know how to package it so that other people can use it and he made it work in three months. And you'll see the result, and then you'll see how all of this has evolved uh, in about a year since. Hello everyone, welcome to QMR Lab, our group's attempt to put quantitative magnetic resonance imaging under one umbrella. Currently, quantitative magnetic resonance imaging is burdened by several problems, such as poor reproducibility, which makes it difficult to re-implement and compare different methods. Difficulties with the user experience due to the lack of support, resulting in a steep learning curve. Scarcity of documentation and tutorials, which makes it difficult to implement and use a particular technique. And finally, code that has a lot of dependencies is developed in-house and is difficult to share. And that is why quantitative magnetic resonance imaging is in need of standardization. QMR Lab really enables researchers to beat the ground running. With QMR Lab, we are hoping to make it easier for people to understand a wide range of MR phenomena, ranging from magnetization transfer, to diffusion MRI, to field mapping, to relaxometry. Within each phenomenon, we explore several commonly recorded metrics. For example, our diffusion MRI modules output mean diffusivity, fractional anisotropy, orientation dispersion, etc. Finally, for some metrics, we provide several implementations. For example, the T1 parameter can be computed using inversion recovery or variable entanglements, illustrating the potential and pitfalls of competing approaches, all under the same umbrella. So, what is on the field of QMR Lab? Well, a wide range of tools that were developed by our lab or adapted from other peer reviewed software packages. There are a number of QMR modules that are organized in classes. Each of these modules is scalable, modifiable, and open to contributions from all of our collaborators worldwide. Finally, the code is open source and collaborative, featuring over 10 core contributors. The main features of QMR Lab are simulations, data fitting, and noise sensitivity analysis, which we will illustrate later in a video example. For all of these, there is a user-friendly graphical user interface. And for those that would like to run things from the console, there is also the batching option. We currently support several different modules, such as diffusion imaging, relaxometry, magnetization transfer, and film mapping. As our network of contributors keeps growing, we expect to move beyond the raw imaging and add even more modules to our toolbox. Let's see what QMR Lab can do for you. QMR Lab supports a wide range of MR modalities implemented as modules. Let's say you're doing QMT that you have acquired a data set using the SRFS method. We'll go through the simple data folder that comes with QMR Lab, and you will notice that our necessary files, including the acquisition protocol and fitting options, are loaded automatically, or can be imported as text files. We can also use the built-in viewer to check our data set, make sure it looks fine before we fit it. And we could try the fitting on a single selected voxel to assess the quality of the fit. And when we're back here with the preview, we can go ahead and fit our data cell. Once the fitting is done, all computed parametric maps are available inside QMR Lab. 
where we can explore them in more details. Trauma Lab also includes the data simulator, with three modes of simulation available. First, the single varsal simulation allows you to generate synthetic thermal signal on the known ground truth and assess how different acquisitions or fitting parameters affect the fitted values. You can thus control the model input values and see the difference between input and output values. Second, you'll find a sensitivity key analysis simulation. In this mode, you can systematically vary one input model or parameter at a time and observe how the fitted model responds to it. Results are conveniently displayed directly inside your model. Finally, you can use the multi parcel distribution mode to generate synthetic data where any input model parameters of your choice are free to vary simultaneously. This allows to evaluate the model response under more realistic constraints. Once again, results can be conveniently viewed directly inside your model. QMR Lab also proposes a simple and intuitive command line usage that can be used to automate QMR processing. QMR List Model provides a list of available QMR methods with a short description. Let's pick MWF. The function QMR usage provides usage description and copy paste examples. First, let's create a model object for MWF. Now, let's define values for the protocol parameters mining water fraction and T2 values. We can now call the plot model method, which shows the expected MR signal curve and T2 distribution. These same methods are available across QMR models. Let's try not to fit a QMR data set for T1 mapping. Note that for each QMR model, a data set is provided for demonstration purposes. Let's show inversion recovery data set in this example and fit a voxel in this set. To display the fitting results, we can use the plot model method shown here. <coughs> If you have feedback or would like to contribute to QMR Lab, please get in touch. You can find us right there on GitHub, and we look forward to hearing from you. All right. So that's JF, and that's about a year ago. Uh, and I really want to start this presentation by first acknowledging all the other people that came after JF. It is truly a collaborative effort. Uh, quite a few of the people are in my lab. Some have graduated, for example, Tangi. Bruce Pike is my uh, postdoc supervisor. He's in Calgary, but he's very supportive of this project and his lab is using it. Ilana is at McGill. She's my former colleague. Um, all of them have contributed immense amounts of time making this work. And uh, the slides that you'll see here, I can take very little credit for them. They've been working very hard to make them happen in time so I can put them all together. So let me tell you a little bit about the genesis of uh, QMR Lab. The genesis is this paper. Quantitative magnetization transfer imaging made easy with QMT Lab, software for data visual simulation, analysis, and visualization. So it started out as a magnetization transfer software, QMT Lab, and we loved this abbreviation because that's the abbreviation for Montreal, because it was made in Montreal. That's a big list of contributors. Um, some of this code was dug up from 20 years ago. That was simulations that Bruce and his student Yves Levesque were using, where's Yves right there? we're using to uh, analyze uh, magnetization transfer data. JF, who you just heard, took it all, packaged it into this interface, and we've really kept that interface intact. The whole GUI is thought of and uh, uh, put together by JF uh, from the very beginning. That's what the GUI looks like. And then, eventually, we said, well, we have this very nice modular infrastructure. We could keep adding magnetization transfer modules. Why not add more quantitative MRI modules? And then we said, well, let's just change one letter there. It still can be used for Montreal, MRL, but now it becomes QMR Lab. And we created this uh, GitHub repository and we started adding more and more modules, basically the modules that our lab is using for day-to-day uh, -day, uh, uh, research. Now, there's a paper. This paper was published in a very low impact journal, intentionally. We probably could have gone with PLOS, we could have gone with Frontiers, but I said, that's the right journal. I don't care that it doesn't have a high impact factor. Honestly, I don't care that there is a publication. Uh, so this QMR lab, we don't plan to publish anytime soon. If people want to cite us, they can cite this paper. But I feel like until there's a proper venue to publish this kind of work, 
I wouldn't want to spend so much time writing 50 page papers for a piece of software that's living on the web and I believe well documented, as I hope you'll uh, agree. So that was JF and the Genesis. The Renaissance happened when uh, Tommy and Aga joined my lab. Tommy is from Macedonia, Aga is uh, from Turkey. I met both of them at the uh, MR Balkan meeting that I told you about, the meeting that I organized uh, in the Balkan region. Uh, they're both programmers. Uh, Aga had some MR physics background, Tommy had none. Uh, but I really am making this effort to uh, employ more and more software engineers in my lab to kind of teach them the physics as they go along. And then this is a very key person to the QMR lab project. This is Mathieu Boudreau. Uh, he's been my collaborator for a very long time. Uh, while I was doing my postdoc, he was doing his PhD. Uh, we published a lot of papers together. And then when he finished his PhD, he said, I don't want to publish papers anymore. I don't want to be a postdoc. Uh, and I asked, would you like to be a software developer? And he said, yeah. He's a physicist. He knows the physics really well, but he's spending a lot of time these days making sure that QMR Lab works for everybody. And these three have produced most of the slides in this uh, presentation. I'll try to give credit when, when the time comes. But uh, Matthew is really a, a, an invaluable resource uh, because there's not that many people in academia uh, that uh, are so excited about software, but have the know-how, have very solid physics background, and uh, you know, a, a very, very good pedigree. So, we just started with our website. The website was rolled out two days ago, and Luis was the first one who saw it. Uh, and then we said, okay, good enough, we'll go live. So let me show you the website right now. And again, this is a trial. I, I'm never sure that it's going to work, so I'm going to try it. All right, so there's the splash screen. Aga designed that. You can see all of the different modules that we're supporting uh, at the moment. And then uh, you will see that we have a couple of different uh, sections here. Uh, I'll get to the blog in a bit, but this is a section for users. So if users want to use QMR Lab, this is the documentation. Uh, it's pretty elaborate and uh, it's uh, uh, collaborative, so anybody can contribute to it. Uh, you will see all of the key features. Data simulator, fitting and visualization. Here's the video that I just showed you. There's the data fitting and visualization. There's all the methods that are available. So you could see a whole list, all of them very well documented if anybody wants to use them. Uh, here's, for example, the T1 relaxometry module because that's the one that uh, I'll talk a lot about. And then there's magnetization transfer, diffusion, and uh, we're actually working on implementing a QSM module. It's already implemented, but we haven't rolled it out yet. Uh, there's instructions on how to install, and uh, these are pretty uh, well uh, documented. You will see all of the dependencies that you need, all of the tests. You will have a beginner's example. If you want to use the GUI, this is what you should do. If you would like to use a batch script, then you could actually just run a shell script and the execution is uh, uh, pretty much faster. So this is if you are a user of QMR Lab, anybody that would like to try it and fit their data uh, using our tools. But the module also has a developer site and this is where uh, we expect more and more people will be contributing uh, to our software package. So the code is on GitHub, we have a wiki page that uh, is directed at developers, not at users. And we have an issue tracker for any bugs that you experience. You could just report it and somebody will get back to you. This is the issue tracker. You see that there's uh, 69 open issues and 112 closed. Uh, that means that we're very active. We're uh, really working hard for everybody that has trouble with QMR Lab to fix it for them. Uh, and you will see that uh, there's lots of contributors here, lots of different people dealing with different issues. Um, and then uh, this here is the wiki for a developer, similar to the users, but a little bit more technical. And uh, then here is our GitHub uh, page, where you will see that uh, there's already uh, been nine releases, uh, 750 commits. So that means that this software is really active, uh, and uh, you know, we, we hope to even speed up as uh, time passes by. So this is how you use QMR Lab. But the other thing that I would really like to point out is that we would like to have a presence in uh, terms of blog posts. I don't want this to be dry. I don't want this to be boring. 
uh, we hope to have lots of content that will convince people to come and check us out. We'll have examples of the different implementations and you will see uh, parts of these blog posts in the rest of my presentation. So I realize that quantitative MR might not be very familiar for everybody. So let me just go through um, one of these uh, introductory posts. It's the Hello World post. And I have just taken out the slides from that post. Um, conventional MRI scans produce images, uh, but different uh, MRI images exhibit different types of contrast. Uh, images are qualitative in nature, uh, so comparisons across scanners and subjects are difficult. Uh, so there it is, the image, the scanner, and then we get a brain. Uh, now, MR scientists would like to make these images more quantifiable, because images are not pictures, they're data, and that data can be properly modeled. So here's the data, and basically the data is a stack of parametric, parametric, sorry, parametrically linked MR images. What does that mean? Well, you vary a certain parameter, and you keep the others constant. Uh, then you have a recipe which will associate the data with a biophysical model or a mathematical description of the signal. And then what you have is all of these images processed through the Q recipe, and eventually you will have a map. So this is the processing and you will have a Q map, which always has to go with a scale bar, because we're talking about numbers, and uh, it's easy to write software that estimates parameters defined in the Q recipe by processing the Q data. Uh, this process is called fitting, and it yields Q maps, quantitative maps. Uh, now, these are the building blocks of QMRI. Q data, Q processing, and Q recipe. And then I will tell you a little bit about the building blocks of QMR Lab, which tries to bring QMRI, quantitative MRI, under one umbrella. It comes with two user interfaces. One is a command line interface, so you can serialize your tasks. And the other is a GUI where you can explore the methods and learn a little bit more about the processing. Um, so this is Aga, who's uh, uh, sometimes uh, pretty funny. So he says, you're always welcome under this umbrella to shield yourself from code usage difficulties. Uh, and there's a numerous, uh, a, a wide number of QMRI methods. Intuitive documentation should be easy to use and reproduce. This is the path. Basically, you can simulate, you can uh, do quality control and optimize, you can visualize and export, and you can fit the data all within the same software package. These are the current methods that we support, and you heard about them a bit more in the video as well. Uh, lots of magnetization transfer, diffusion, relaxometry, field mapping. These are the things that we use in our lab. Uh, if you are a developer, then the steps are slightly different. What you need to do is you need to notify us that you would like to contribute. We will discuss it with you, make sure that this is a good fit for QMR Lab, and then you can actually get your hands dirty, make a pull request, make the edits you would like, and eventually you can make a merge request, at which point we will review your contribution, and if it adheres to the QMR Lab standards, we will merge it. If it does not, we will work with you until it does. Uh, at least for the beginning, that's not difficult to do uh, because we don't support that many people uh, at this moment. <laughs> so what's under the hood of QMR Lab? Well, we have a GUI and command line interface for MATLAB, except I know that MATLAB is not open source code. People need to pay a license. So we also support Octave. The nice thing about Octave is that it's pretty much a, 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 a free open source copy of MATLAB. Not 100%, but 99%. And uh, that makes it very easy for us to uh, avoid uh, licensing issues for people that need to run it without a MATLAB installation. Uh, we do version controlling, everything is on GitHub. I'm curious, how many of you have used GitHub either to, okay, wonderful, wonderful. It's, you, believe me, you know, two years ago, I don't think that would have been the case. So this is really, you know, picking up and I think we're, we're, we're riding that wave. Um, we have continuous integration. We have a Travis uh, continuous integration uh, module, which makes sure that everything runs and there's no bugs. Uh, we share the data together with our processing routines. And we also have this documentation that you saw. So these are all the different boxes that we want to keep under the hood of QMR Lab. Fitting, protocols, data, simulations, and so on. So it's difficult to explain all the modules. So I said I will talk much more about T1 mapping. Yesterday, you heard me say, if we can't fix T1 mapping, then we can't fix QMR. Uh, it's really the foundation. It's the most basic, fundamental, quantitative parameter, maybe with T2. And uh, we've done a lot of work on getting T1 mapping right. This is a paper that uh, we published in 2011, 
I believe, with uh, Joelle Barral. So uh, she is currently at Google, but she's still uh, collaborating and working with us uh, on T1 mapping routines. Uh, this paper has this very nice exponential curve. I think it's, it, it, it will keep growing because it's really saying if you want to do T1 mapping right, this is the slow but reliable way of doing it. And then there's the paper that I showed you yesterday on the accuracy of T1 mapping, searching for common ground. And you will see that this one also is getting cited more and more. This paper basically says now that we have a robust methodology, now we can compare different T1 mapping methods and see where the problems lie. It's a negative result paper. It says we have problems. But it is a top five MRM paper for the year in which, in which it was published. And I thought that that will really kind of, you know, push us forward. And then we said, well, that was all about brain mapping. Let's talk about cardiac T1 mapping. You saw the preprint yesterday. And uh, that's where we realized, actually, you know, people might not be on board yet. Uh, so this is the paper where we wanted to use QMR Lab to process some cardiac T1 mapping uh, uh, fits. And uh, what happened is uh, we wanted to bring this all out in the open. Here's the preprint. And then here is all the data. Here is the link to QMR Lab. Here's how you can load the data. Here's how you can process it. And what we did is we measured many different parameters, magnetization transfer, T2, Molly, Schmolly, Sasha, and inversion recovery T1 maps. And for each of those, we can have these interactive plots where you can see what are the reasons for outliers, which ones should you take out, and why. Uh, we also look at the distributions uh, of T1 in particular longitudinally, week one, week two, week three, all the way up to week six. And we notice that there is a problem Molly, Schmolly, Sasha, and Inversion Recovery give you a wide range of values going from 990 all the way to 1250. Now, that's a problem because these techniques are actually running on the scanners as a black box. You just click a button, a, radio a, a radiologist or cardiologist clicks a button, and out comes a T1 map, and they use it for diagnosis. So we wanted to shine a light on this problem, and we wanted to explain what is causing all of these problems. Here are the correlations with different parameters. And our conclusion is magnetization transfer contributes. Until that's resolved, we really need to refrain from using cardiac T1 mapping in the lab. Uh, everything is supported with the data. The analysis is there. This paper has a very similar DNA as the one that is top five MRM, except MRM turned it down. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's understandable. Uh, we will keep trying to publish this uh, in an alternate format, but QMR Lab makes this transparent, makes it easy for everybody to convince themselves that this is correct. Now, I want to show you what we just did with a T1 mapping module. And this is not even published yet. Basically, I said, well, given that this preprint is already out, people can read it. I'm not going to bother resubmitting to another journal. Instead, I will do something that is currently invited as a book chapter from Elsevier, a major publisher. Uh, and they said, we would like you to write uh, uh, a book chapter on T1 mapping. And I said, I just wrote a book chapter on T1 mapping for cardiac, which I did with Joel from Google and a couple of other people. I didn't show you that. Uh, but if you agree that I can keep this on the web, then you will have permission to include it in your book. And they agreed. So this is Mathieu Boudreau, the programmer that I told you about creating an introductory module for inversion recovery T1 mapping, where first you can see the sequence. Here's all the equations. And then you can actually see the graphs, which function just as a static image, but also function as interactive maps that you can zoom in out and do many different kinds of analysis. For example, you can vary the inversion time and see how different approximations affect your fit. Okay? Or, you could try simulated data, and you can change the TR and see how well your fit matches your simulated data. And you will see that as TR goes down, your fit is worse and worse. Again, this works as a static image. You can include it in a book. But on the web, it really gains its power. Here's the different images that go in. You can go and cycle through them, so different kinds of contrasts. And you can just move around and see what the T1 values are in different parts of the brain. And finally, uh, this is where you can simulate the noise. You can have a noiseless signal and you can have a Monte Carlo simulation. You could look at the different uh, uh, artifacts that arise from uh, adding noise. And again, 
you could do this variation uh, with a slider that enables you to develop some intuition about uh, the process. Uh, this is just the first part of a series. Eventually, it will be a book chapter. And also, all the code from this, which is pretty clean, can actually be seen right above the figure if you just click a checkbox. So here's the code. It's embedded. You can see exactly the code and the data that generated these graphs. And if you would like to actually generate the same graphs, so you see there's the code, there's the code. You can also go to something called Binder, which I will introduce in a bit. And that's where, yeah, there's no internet connection, so now that's not gonna work. But that's where you can actually modify the code and make changes as you see fit. Now, you see how I'm building this kind of pipeline. I would really like to you know, automate a lot of this. And here's an XKCD um, uh, uh, drawing that says, check it out. I made a fully automated data pipeline that collects and processes all the information we need. And then uh, another person asks, is it a giant house of cards built from random scripts that will all completely collapse the moment any, mo any input does anything weird? And yeah, it might not be. I guess that's, whoops, just collapsed. Hang on, I can patch it. You've all been there, you've all seen this. Now, there is one thing that can prevent us from this happening. And that is um, code that can capture dependencies. These are called containers. How many of you have heard about containers? Okay, how many of you have used them? Beautiful, you know, this, is, this is really <laughs> an advanced audience. Uh, so uh, these are, you know, for those that don't know, a container is a way to encapsulate a certain piece of code and fix it in time, and then it runs kind of like a virtual machine. So it doesn't matter where it was built, it doesn't matter what language it was built in, you can encapsulate it, and then you can use it to process data. For example, you can build a QMR Lab container. It could be a fixed moment of time, a snapshot of the QMR Lab software, and then you could use this to you know, run things in the cloud, for example. So, I have a tool, and I have a Docker. I have Dockerized QMR Lab. Uh, what do we do with Dockerized QMR Lab? Well, we can run it on Compute Canada. We can use high-performance computing to ensure that this will run fast because it is a nine gigabyte uh, container, and uh, sometimes the processing power uh, you know, leaves something to be desired. So high-performance computing in Canada is actually very good. And we all have free access as faculty for uh, you know, su sufficient amounts of space and processing power. So we are currently working on deploying QMR Lab uh, on uh, Compute Canada using the Seabrain infrastructure that uh, you know, some of you have heard about. Uh, this is uh, Alan Evans and his team uh, that uh, have built this uh, very large uh, infrastructure that's also used worldwide, I believe. Cuba is using it and I believe Mexico is also uh, using it. So. Uh, we hope that Canada will become this kind of hub for uh, high-performance computing. So let me repeat what uh, JF told you. Uh, we have a code base that gathers tools, it's peer-reviewed code, it's modular, it's open source, published under an MIT license, and we have uh, over 10 contributors in about five sites in the world at the moment. The functionality, we have simulations, fitting, noise analysis, a graphical user, user interface, and batching. The methods we support are diffusion, relaxometry, magnetization transfer, and field mapping. And then we would like to deploy and integrate with different kinds of uh, interfaces. For example, we can use Octave, we can use a shell script with Python syntax, and we can use the high performance computing and a lot of standards such as the boutique standard, of course GitHub, Singularity, to really utilize all of these uh, resources that are uh, at our hands. So, we care about reproducible analysis. That's the reason that we're doing QMR Lab. The recipe for a reproducible analysis, code is on GitHub or another you know, code uh, hosting uh, site. Data is publicly available somewhere, could be on the Open Science Framework, could be on Zenodo. All of these actually are pretty cheap at the moment uh, and uh, you know, everybody, I encourage everybody to use them. Then you can dockerize your environment, so you can create this virtual machine that you know, can be easily ported. And finally, you can do interactive plots and analysis using Jupyter Notebooks. The Jupyter Notebooks are something that, uh, uh, again, I'm not sure how many of you have used. How many of you have used Jupyter Notebooks? Beautiful, wow. Okay. 
Um, so then maybe I don't have to explain too much, but you know, this is uh, a presentation that actually has hyperlinks, so you can create a GitHub account. Then you can talk about, you know, that's some links about different kinds of data uh, hosting uh, platforms. This is a link to Docker, uh, and this is a link to a Jupyter tutorial. And then in the context of uh, QMR Lab, working with uh, Jupyter Notebook is fun, but it's not enough to create a reproducible analysis if you only run it locally. So because people may not have the exact same software versions that you installed in your computer, we will provide you with the tools to create a reproducible QMR analysis. And basically our recipe is something that we are publishing on a probably uh, weekly basis with different kinds of tutorials about how you can get a Jupyter Notebook running. So let me show you one of these tutorials. This is where the network might come in handy. I thought I had all of them open, but maybe not. Should I try the other network? Sure. CMAT? ICMAT. ICMAT. ICMAT 2008. Okay, you know, it's, it's fine. Uh, you know, it's, it's on the website, and it's, it's a small part of the presentation, so I will, I will just keep going. I think everything else is actually loaded already. So there is a tutorial on how you can get a Jupyter Notebook running, including how you install Anaconda, which is a Python environment, and how you can get a QMR Lab simple Jupyter Notebook running uh, on, uh, on the cloud uh, using the Binder platform. I'm not going to spend too much time. Seems like you're already aware of a lot of these tools, and I just want to finish up with a couple of more uh, slides. Oh, there you go. Now, it, so which one was the password? Can you type it? CMAT 2008. Yeah, I mean, Edurone was also working well. Never mind, it's fine. Uh, so, we're creating workflows. That's what we care about. You have one acquisition and you have another acquisition. We want to do quality control, we want to parse, pre-process, we want to fit. But we also want to make sure that there is provenance, that there is a recording of the steps taken to perform this analysis. QMR Lab lets you do that. And it also introduces some statistics modules that enable you to tell is this acquisition comparable to this acquisition? These are some of the modules that we have used in different kinds of abstracts. Uh, so this is for magnetization transfer. This is the one that you saw for uh, T1 mapping in the heart. Uh, and again, I imagine this presentation will be available. You can always reach out to me if any of these links are not clearly legible. And the other thing that we would really like to do is we would like to engage with industry. Uh, because the way this will work is if we make it easy for anybody who has an MRI scanner to use our tools. So this is Heart Vista. It's a Stanford startup. Uh, some of my colleagues where I did my PhD uh, got it going. Uh, they do real-time imaging. Uh, and uh, we actually have uh, the Heart Vista software, which is called RT Hawk. We're currently running it locally on a computer, but we're one of the first three Siemens sites in the world that will have Heart Vista running. Hard Vista currently runs on GE. That's the, the, the platform where they developed first. But Siemens is on board. And what we want to do is we want to integrate QMR Lab to an acquisition framework such as Hard Vista, and then fetch the data from the scanner and generate quantitative MR maps. We're building a plugin. So you know, that opens the doors to the app and uh, can be used by external software installed on a workstation. So we will have a way of getting data straight from the scanner, processed, using Hard Vista, and uh, the maps will uh, be really you know, a click of a button. Uh, we can trigger a QMR workflow, and then we can generate quantitative maps at the scanner site. Now, what has made all of this possible? It's the grant that I told you about yesterday. The Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform, $11 million, pan-Canadian, uh, with about 500,000 dedicated to communications. Uh, these are the committees, uh, and I'm leading the communications committee. We've just added one more co-chair, that's uh, Lara Boyd from UBC. And the reason we have two uh, chairs, and these are, these are the partners I showed you yesterday. The reason we have two chairs is because we really have two-pronged approach to communication. Lots of people think that communication is PR, journalism, press release offices, you know, what, whatever they, they end up doing. But in our head, and when I say our, I mean Pierre Belek and Samir Das, they're both in Montreal at the moment. 
is that outreach is great when we partner up with different kinds of institutions, such as Force 11. The meeting is in Montreal in three days. I need to get there. But also, we need to use all of these tools that I introduced to you to be able to execute something that we have a working title called Analysis in Brief. Analysis in Brief is a CONP deliverable that will make it easy for you to reproduce the analysis from a particular paper. We have a partner in the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. They just announced a publishing platform. The name is Aperture. I think it's a fun name because Aperture, the association is imaging, but also it's open. Uh, and the idea is that OHBM would really like to use this concept of analysis in brief to publish innovative research objects. Aperture is not a journal, it's a publishing platform. Our vision for what it could publish is the T1 mapping tutorial I showed you. It reads as a review, except it's way richer than any static PDF could possibly be. So here's an example of what analysis in brief might look like. It's a simple example. But basically, we use Binder to uh, put Jupyter Notebooks in the cloud. And uh, we need to define the package names, and we can have a GitHub repository. Uh, once we have that, uh, we can, uh, and if we don't want to use Python, we can add a Docker file, and we can use MATLAB or Octave or any other language. Uh, with a click, uh, we can start uh, interacting with the code. So here's an email from Aga, who says, here's the MTR analysis. You click on that, and Binder executes the analysis. Uh, you can load the data right away. That's the first step. The data is hosted somewhere. Uh, then you can calculate. And this is the code. The code is actually interactive. So you can execute it right here from a browser and you will generate an empty off, empty on, and a magnetization transfer ratio. That's a very simple analysis, but it's all done there. And then you can make changes in the script. So if you would like to see a different slice in this uh, image, you could just change the slice number and you will display a difference. So it's much easier to analyze a 3D image using these resources. But again, that's just a very simple change. You could be changing way more than just the slice number. Once you do that, you can also analyze and visualize the data. So you can use Python to visualize the results. And uh, what you can do is get these interactive plots that I also showed you for the cardiac analysis, where you can see what each of these points is and you can do different kinds of uh, filtering of the data uh, using uh, those uh, analysis tools that come feature of Plotly. Plotly is a Montreal startup. They work with interactive visualizations and uh, they, they do great work. Aperture. Aperture is the new publishing platform. Aperture would like to partner up with CONP. Actually, CONP is funding uh, two developers for Aperture. That's pretty much half of the operation. Uh, the governance is very open in the sense that uh, we would like to incorporate as many OHBM members in the process. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a busy slide, but uh, what I want to point out is that Vincent Larivière is a Canada Research Chair for the Transformation of Scholarly Communication. Uh, he is not a neuroimager. He's actually somebody that works with libraries. And whenever there is a publishing discussion in the media, he's the one that uh, talks about it. So he's given many interviews for Wired, for different kinds of publications. And uh, he's really the one that understands the business model of publishing, something that we're all uh, still uh, new at. So the reason I'm wearing this shirt is right there. The current way we do science. We acquire the data. We pre-process the data. We do the analysis. And finally, we publish. There's lots of hurdles to jump. And I don't need to explain to you that each of these hurdles takes way longer than you ever think. Our vision is that this should be much more straightforward. That there is a way to create a workflow where you can go from the acquisition, through the pre-processing and analysis, through the uh, sharing and publishing of these analyses. So consider it a sprint, or if you want to you know, comment about the way I do science, it's more of a stroll. I tend to take things very, very slowly. And uh, I told you about that yesterday, and you know, you'll probably see it in, in, in the way that, in my frequency of publishing. Uh, so I think we're about to wrap up. Uh, and uh, I know that this was a very busy presentation. Uh, but for now, at this moment, I'd just like you to forget everything you know about quantitative MRI, everything I just told you, and I will show you the video that won the People's Choice Award at the ISMRM meeting. And uh, basically, our abstract for QMR Lab 
uh, then uh, got taken up by Aga, and he created something for a 10-year-old. So, uh, you know, forget everything you know about MR, uh, take a look at what he did, and uh, after that I will be very happy to, to answer questions. Hello everyone, in the next magnetic moments I will explain you why MR with numbers is different than the regular MR, and how our tool, QMR Lab, makes it easy to use. Every MR image is a symphony, and just like a symphony, the image is composed of many parts. Each of those parts is a complex melody played by different instruments. Let's hear one of our favorites, the Brain Symphony. Symphonies are pleasant to listen to, but only a skilled conductor can tell when one of the instruments is out of tune. That is why it is important to break down the music into the individual instrument solos. Wouldn't it be easier for them to hear each instrument separately? And this is where MRI numbers comes to our help. Think of a magic app where you can put regular MR images in, cast some magic spells, and produce a separate music sheet for each instrument. This is what MRI with numbers does. From these music sheets, we can create a solo for each instrument. Let's hear the symphony again, but this time each instrument will play one by one. So with that, I want to thank all of these people that have contributed to QMR Lab. And as always, we are recruiting. So if anybody would like to uh, work with us, I'd be happy to talk to you. So thank you for your attention. Sorry, on? Uh, is your lab already working on new tools for diffusion? Uh, we are. Uh, usually we implement those that we're using. Uh, we have an Excalibur module that we haven't put in yet. Uh, but uh, you know, anything that is useful to us, we will implement. And if other people have code for other models of diffusion that they would like to share with us, then we will incorporate it into the next release. Okay. Nice. Uh, very nice talk very nice tools that you've built. Thank you. Um, just perhaps a word of warning coming from the past. Uh, when tools are very nice, and this is the curse of diffusion and topography, when they are so beautiful, when they are so colorful, physicians, doctors tend to overinterpret them. That's true. Um, so 
it might, you, you have shown some uh, words of caution in the text that you have shown us, but it is in the text, yep. right? So yep. perhaps it would also be useful to have them being displayed at some point during the, when you're reviewing the T1 maps and etc. what are the pitfalls? And I know that you are very vocal on the pitfalls of any, of any technique. So just, uh, you know, there's, I still meet many physicians who think that streamlines in tractography are individual actions. Exactly, yeah. So um, I wouldn't want that to happen to you. And, and I have to say, when I think of my audience, even though the vision is, yeah, you know, you just create this workflow and everybody just clicks a, clicks a button, I really feel like the QMR lab target audience is the researchers and not the clinicians. Mm -hmm. Who knows? You know, you never know. You, you build one thing and it turns into another. But um, the clinicians already have pretty tools, you know, like they can, they can just click and get a T1 map, you know, from a semen scanner. That's a complete black box and they don't even know what the code is and they will interpret it and diagnose people based on that. Uh, this is primarily in-house code. I don't think we have any, well, we have an MP2 Rage kind of hack because you need to pay for an MP2 Rage license. <laughs> so we wrote something that, you know, can process MP2 Rage images. But most of the time, these are in-house software that people have written at home and have no way of making it easy for other people to use. Maybe 30, min 30 years down the line, that becomes standard clinical software, but I, I don't think we're gonna face the problem of a clinician using this and saying, oh, look how beautiful it is. I, it's really, you know, you're, you're the audience here, people that are involved in research. Uh, it's really far from clinical practice, as far as I can predict. But it's true, the, the caveats are there and there should be a word of warning every time somebody wants to overinterpret data. Very nice tools, thank you. Okay, more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, so I haven't used it, so can you talk a little bit more about how you go and, so you, this is for individual images or can you do group analysis uh, as you have shown? Yep. But can you talk a little bit more about? You, you can. So. That's why we have a GUI uh, and we have a command line interface. Um, with the GUI, it's going to be slow, but it's a great tool for quality control. You know, like you can really spend hours just saying, oh, you know, what if I change this parameter? Oh, let me see what happens when I fit this. So the GUI is beautiful for that, but I would not advise that you process even a single subject with that. So that's why we have the command line interface, both in Octave and in MATLAB, and we can batch. So there is a, a separate section in the documentation that's for batching, and then you can run this analysis. Now. If you run it locally and you have a QMT data set, your batching is going to take a month for 30 subjects because it's about a subject a day. Uh, that's why we need the Compute Canada resources so we can really speed this up. QMT has always been slow. I mean, it's always taken a day for me, but I feel like if I told people, yeah, QMR lab, 30 days and you know, <laughs> you'll have your analysis done. It's, it's not the way to, to, to do it. That's the way I did it five years ago. <laughs> Right, so the statistical analysis is something that I'm really um, working hard on and th the problem is that there isn't good statistical analysis for quantitative MRI. There is for fMRI, maybe for diffusion, but all of these you know, T1, T2 maps, we don't know how to properly compare them. So in parallel, we're building, building in some other people's tools. So for example, there is this robust correlation toolbox from Cyril Pernet, who many of you know, uh, we incorporate it into QMR Lab to uh, do a concordance analysis. But also what we do is we want to develop the statistical tools so that I can answer certain questions that at the moment I don't think the scientists are capable of answering. So there are statistics modules, people can plug them in. We plugged in serials uh, and we have an ROI analysis tool. But you know, that, that doesn't really do much. Primarily because there isn't good statistics for quantitative MR. There is for fMRI and we're hoping to catch up there. Yeah. Just, just out of curiosity, how do you embed a MATLAB license within a container? Yeah, no, so uh, you don't. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah, but Seabrain has a lot of MATLAB licenses. Okay. Okay. So that's, you know, one, one thing. And then the other is you can have an Octave container. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, we, the, the Compute Canada piece of the puzzle is really, really important here. So when you are going to uh, these big clusters, you need to switch from Docker to Singularity, right? Yeah, so for now we've only been using Docker, uh, but uh, I, I, I envision that there will be also a Singularity uh, container. Okay. And I think uh, it's 
talking about the, your strategy in how you are receiving contributions for everyone and then you have your team. But it's that, do you think that is better than, for, for instance, DiPy? Mm -hmm. So in DiPy, the people involved in releasing all these tools have a very long and complicated training program. Yep. Yep. But it's not the case for you. You yep. receive contributions yep. for everyone yep. and then you have a team that could. Yeah. So, so it's really, it's really tailoring to the community. Uh, DiPy is working with a community of developers who know software engineering. You know, like they're... The, the ISMRM quantitative MRI community, they're physicists. And, you know, they have this MATLAB code and it's poorly documented. And, you know, it's, it's 10 generations passed on and they really don't know or want to, you know, get trained. So we're more kind of like, hey, you know, if you have the code, spend some time, that's what we did with QMT, and work with us, we'll you know, help you get it out there. In the long run, sure, everybody becomes a programmer in that white matter study group community, and then, you know, then maybe we can incorporate more of the DiPy model. For now, we really feel like we need to hold people's hands. Uh, and uh, so far, it's not that hard. Everything we've done so far, it's useful to us. If we see things are getting out of hand, we're too popular, well, that's a problem we want to have and we'll, we'll deal with it. Because Eleftherius is always inviting people to contribute and I think many people are saying, okay, yes, yes, but I don't have time to... But here's the thing. So here's what I'm doing, for example, the T1 mapping module, right? So, you know, that's a book chapter. So now we have this and I'm reaching out to a T1 row contributor, somebody that will do a, 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 a text on T1 row. And I'm looking for somebody who will say, I have the code. And I'm like, okay, you write the text and you tell me what to do with the code because I want to have T1 row. And it's worth for me because, you know, I, I get this publication out, you know, whatever that might mean. Uh, I'm prototyping as we speak. You know, all of these things are just trials. Let me see what works. I always like to experiment with form. And finally, there's societies behind this. So I feel like not everything is going to fall through the cracks. Um, I made the mistake of three days ago of finishing on a downer. And I'm about to, you know, <laughs> give you a downer. 90% of this is not going to work. Okay. I mean, it's just probability. <laughs> And I don't know what aspect of this is going to work. You know, maybe it's going to be the, the workflow. Maybe it's going to be binder and the publishing. I don't know. So we really need to try everything. Show people rather than tell. Because if I talk about it, it just sounds too ambitious. And then, you know, hope for the best that maybe something, some of these initiatives uh, picks up. But most likely, most of them will fail. And that's just, that's fine. Okay. okay. So, thank you, Randy, for Thank you.